Okay, today is Friday, July 14th, 2017, and we are interviewing J.R. Stillwell in Springfield, Illinois. Mr. Stillwell is 82 years old, having been born on February 6th, 1935. My name is Joanne Jennings, and I'll be your interviewer today. Our court reporter is Jill Layton. Um, please state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in. I served in the Korean era and in the United States Army. Okay. And where were you born? Santa Barbara, California. And can you tell me a little bit about your family growing up, your parents and any siblings? Uh, well, I'm a, I guess you would call it uh, Army brat. My dad was already a three-stripe sar sergeant when they're chasing Pancho Villa around on the Mexican border. Mm -hmm. He was a master sergeant in World War I and a captain in World War II. All of his non-active service in a few years uh, was all National Guard, actually. The guard service in, on the border and then activated for World War I and voluntarily activated himself for World War II. Uh, my time I did enlist, I was three year three year enlistee in the Army, thinking I was going to make a career of it, and dropped out but made a career out of the Reserve. I'm, I'm reti reti retired as, as a Master Sergeant in the Reserve with 26 years of service. Okay. Did you have any siblings? Were they no. in the military? No. Okay. Um, how old were you when you entered? Service. When I when went in service, mm -hmm. hey, let's see here now. That would be about 19, I guess. And what were you doing um, before you? You as said you enlisted. As, as right? little as possible. As little as possible. I had, I actually, I, might have been, I actually took a year, one of the few people that took a PG year in high school. Didn't what? have it. I ran with, in my neighborhood, all the kids were a year younger than I was. What's a PG year? Post-grad. Post-grad year, okay. And uh, so I went, uh, I, they were all in high school a year after I got out and graduated. Mm -hmm. So that made it real easy. I could go back and take courses I wanted to take or th thought I wanted to take. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I was, uh, I, I had been elected the year before to, since I was going to still be in high school to be the uh, president of the Champaign County Junior Red Cross program, and I was a business, man uh, business manager for the school paper, and I took about four, four classes. One lasted about two days after school started. I just got up and walked out. Another one lasted a couple of months after well afterwards, and I just quit. That was a nice advantage to it. I didn't have to. It, you didn't have it, to. I did. I did. Yeah, you know. I already had the diploma. I was uh -huh. only taking the, the courses. Uh, so I was just taking various uh, casual courses to, to, for basically for something to do. Uh -huh. And then I, after, the, uh, after, after that uh, summer, uh, after the other class graduated, then uh, I worked as a, uh, well, while I was in high school, uh, a local uh, guy that was in the guard, they, they got activated the guard, and I went down to uh, a locksmith shop, and I worked uh, as a, uh, after school and uh, doing some of the grunt work that, uh, that he had done, or that they, they could hold off until I got back, and then I, I worked there until, uh, actually until, uh, until I went in, into uh, uh, service. Uh, and then when I came came home after I came back from service, I fumbled through a couple of jobs and then went back to work for them until uh, I don't remember exactly how long, but I worked overall period of time as a, uh, in the lock shop for around ten years, including high school and mm -hmm. and that. And then uh, I I was but I came home was home about six months. Uh, well, I had six months. To get in, to go into the reserve, if I wanted to keep my rank, mm -hmm. well, I was an E5. So mm -hmm. let's don't be stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I lasted out. I waited about about four months before I went in 
I went on back on went down and went on uh, got in the active reserve, uh, and one of the officers in the reserve had an opening in his office over at the University of Illinois, and uh, one night we spent most of the reserve unit time him talking to me about coming to work for him over there, and I did, and I wound up 38 years later retiring from the University of Illinois. Hmm. But I did finish up a 20, uh, what would be a total of a 26-year uh, period of time in the Army mm -hmm. uh, and in the Reserve, and basically in the units in the Cham there in the Champaign-Urbana area. And then on my, I finished my last five years in the Reserve in a Reserve, de uh, reserve unit uh, in uh, Indianapolis, traveling back and forth mm -hmm. once a month. To, sometimes twice a month, sometimes three times a month to go to reserve meetings. Mm -hmm. And you said you were 19 when you enlisted? Pro that would sound about right. I was 21, I turned 21 overseas. So. What um, made you decide to enlist? Do you remember? Well, <laughs> again, I wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was on, on all the other... Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of the guys that I was in that room had already volunteered and went in the Navy. They came home one weekend. The one kid that I really spent more time with than all the, all the others was already in his first year at U of I. And we weren't really getting a chance to run around together too much either. And they came home one weekend from Great Lakes. And it was right after they had announced the factor that they were going to cut off the GI, Korean GI Bill as of January the 31st. Mm -hmm. Well, this other kid decided that he was in the Navy. He was in the Navy Reserve ROTC. He decided he was going to volunteer to go on active duty so he could get that for his schooling. And I said, I ain't going to do anything. And so a few days, a few days later, uh, I kept looking around. I said, well, what the hell? They've all gone. Mm -hmm. There ain't anybody else around here that I'm running around with. So uh, I went down and uh, enlisted with, uh, with it. And uh, Jerry and I went to Chicago together on the train. They put me through, ran me through, and they held him over. So I got in one day before he did. Mm. <laughs> but uh, I, then uh, I basically, uh, oh, I mean, I had thought of it because because of, I've been around, been in the family all mm -hmm. those years, uh -huh. all, all that period uh -huh. of time. And I'd been around it all, uh, all the time all my life in, a, in one, one form or another uh, with the, the dad with the with the guard mm -hmm. uh, my dad's younger brother uh, actually was a private with him down on the Mexican border and already went to OCS and was was commissioned was a second lieutenant and killed at, uh, in action in World War one so I never knew my uncle mm -hmm. but uh, um, when you enlisted, you said it was right at the end of the Korean War? Yeah, it's, uh, well, yeah. You, it, Did you if know? You, that? If you were on active duty by the 31st day of January, of January in 1955, mm -hmm. you, were, you were considered a wartime veteran mm -hmm. under the Korean GI Bill. Did you know that the Korean War was coming to an end? Oh, yeah. You, okay. See, that's why, that's why I said the others, this is why this other kid... He knew he wouldn't he be He volunteered there. to go in out of yeah. the Navy Reserve, he he and I said going. I wasn't going to do anything. Uh -huh. And then after about a couple, about a, oh, that was, we knew it a month or so, a couple of months ahead of time. I mean, it was public knowledge. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it was, and they advertised it and everything. And so finally, when it got down to the point where I was a, lo I was a, uh, a lone, a lone eagle all around there at that point in time, uh, and I didn't have a job. I was going to a uh, one room commercial college, turn, uh, taking some bookkeeping classes just for something to do, basically. So I finally decided I'll I'll I'll, I'll go ahead and, and enlist. Uh, I had thought about it anyhow. Like I say, at one point in time, I was even had thought through all those years that once I finally went in, I'd go I'd be I'd go in and probably possibly make it. And even after I was in for a while, uh, I. Wasn't sure whether I was going to stay in. I wasn't really sure whether I wasn't going to stay in and make a career out of it. Mm -hmm. Virtually till uh, after, really after I got home, mm -hmm. I had a I had a chance at a nice at a pretty nice position if I had stayed where I was overseas and then extended into it that way. But I decided not to, 
And uh, when I came home, then I decided that I didn't want to. And uh, but I had I had two two opportunities while I was on active duty. One right out of basic, and one a little later on to go to OCS. And uh, Dad and I talked about it by over the phone. And uh, he didn't encourage it in any way. He didn't he didn't uh, discourage it in any way, except maybe one. He says, "Well, he says, of course, he had served both, and he." It, mm -hmm. Like I say, he was a master in World War One. Got his commission after World War One, uh, and then uh, so I knew a little of both sides of the coin. And but then after after that, I decided, well, I could if I had those chances, and I'd go with what I what with what I had at the present time. And if I wanted to try it later, I could try it later. And I just never tried. Mm -hmm. Where did you um, do your basic training? I took my basic training at Fort Ch at whoops at Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. Now Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. And you, but you were in California at the time. Is that no, no, no. I was born in California. We moved back to Illinois when I was about see. five months old. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, where did you grow up in Illinois? Uh, Champaign, Illinois. Uh, mm -hmm. I went first grade, kindergarten, first grade in Champaign, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Second grade at Lone Oak Children's School, uh, Ch Lone Oak Community High School, Lone Oak, Kentucky, which is a uh, now in, almost integrated in with Paducah. It was out in the country when we were down there. Uh, then I took third, fourth at uh, Washington School, Vandalia. Fifth grade, Fort Benning Children's School. Sixth grade in Vandalia, seventh to graduate in that extra year mm -hmm. uh, at uh, of uh, high school and back in Champaign. Uh, when they hit Pearl, uh, Dad volunteered as an uh, as an individual guard from the guard to go on active duty. And me by the middle of March, in forty two, he was gone, mm -hmm. uh, and then. Uh, they, he didn't get what he wanted, <laughs> and he, he uh, they put him in the Ordnance Corps and sent him down to the Kentucky Ordnance Works in Paducah. And so he was. There was a very small military contingent there. There was a major. It was a command. Dad was number two. I, there was. I know there was one lieutenant. I think maybe two lieutenants. Uh, that was probably the entire officer corps down there, and there were. A few sergeants and a couple other guards. Everybody else, including most of the most of the guards around there, were, were local civilians. Uh, and then Dad wanted out of that. He started writing letters to get away from the Ordnance Corps. He and uh, they accepted it, so they shipped him out, sent him up, put him in the MPs. He was the MPs for the rest of World War Two, and. Uh, but then that was what he was doing, and he, he uh, at at Benning, he was at Benning uh, on post with the MPs for a small period of time. Then he was out at the uh, Fort Benning prisoner war camp, and then they had a satellite work camp at Charleston, South Carolina. He was over there for about a year. Then when he came back to Benning, he was out on the PW camp for a short period of time. They moved him in on post, and he had both the uh, the, the army was still segregated, of course, at the end of, even at, the, at that point in time yet. And so they put him on post in command of uh, both of two MC, MP companies, so one of the Section 2 MPs. He had the permanent party and the transit MP company, two both black companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were there for a year. While, then when he, when they, that was when they finally shipped him out. And same over to uh, he was go overseas, and he was just in the process of making the arrangements. He was went over to Austria, and he was making the arrangements to bring us over there. Uh, when he got slightly sick and had to go to the hospital, and they figured they didn't need a 40, 45 year old army captain left in the army at that point in time. The war was over with, so they sent him home. So it took me to go over 
it's quite a few years later. <laughs> but uh, no, we traveled. I mean, I, I yeah. saw. Uh, but uh, we uh, spent most of the, uh, we spent all the time either the two years. My my grandparents lived with us. It was our house in Champagne. Mm -hmm. So if we were living in Vandalia, I'd go up and spend maybe a couple of weeks with them in Champagne in the summertime. Uh, but then when we, we moved back there, well, we moved back there really because his mother fell, broke her hip, and uh, uh, went to the hospital and never got out of the hospital. And so then we had to go back up there because he's uh, to help take care of his, his dad. And uh, we moved into that. We moved into the house that I'm in right now. On and I don't know. I can't say the date, but it was on. Wednesday, the day after the national elections in 1936, and I've been in that house. Other than traveling with, uh, to with while Dad was gone World War II or my time on active duty, I've been in that house ever since. How was it uh, for you to leave Champaign to go to Basic? Was that uh, were you scared? Were you excited? No, were you no? I mean, no? no, I mean I, that. Uh, Of course, my mother. My mother was uh, originally she, she was married to uh, another World War One vet, uh, and that's where she got her auxiliary membership. And after the divorce, she made sure her auxiliary membership never died. Uh So she, although she had the basis for dad's membership, she, well, that wasn't the problem. Uh, so, but she uh, she brought her membership, of course, up to Champagne, and then while we were well, in the years we were living in Vandalia, she didn't transfer her membership. She stayed there, but she was uh, just as active with the unit there as she would have been if she'd been a member of that specific mm -hmm. unit. And then the same way with the churches and that. I mean, uh, but no, I, I I went through from uh, the end of, from the end, shall we say, from the end of, end of first grade uh, to uh, seventh grade, basically, with, with dad around only two years mm -hmm. uh, of any extended period of time. And those were two two separate years. Mm -hmm. They weren't uh, continuous mm -hmm. years. So no, I mean, I, at that point in time, at least the way I, I look back at the, that time, and especially the time at Benning when I was down there, when you're an army brat or a military brat, uh, you have your own conception of the military. Mm -hmm. uh, you and you understand the set. Uh, at least in those days, you understood the rankings. Mm -hmm. You knew who what a what a general officer meant. You knew what a colonel what a colonel was. You made especially if you were living around a military installation in and around because uh, if you didn't wasn't very long before your father or your mother had you well versed to make sure that you didn't slip up. I yeah. mean, uh, the military was, was, uh, has been that way all the way through. So, I mean, it was nothing. And so I was, I, I, I lived around with dad, although the, the guard before World War II really wasn't doing all the stuff they're doing now. He might be gone for a few days or something like that, but they didn't have the, all the training and they drill once a week or something like that. But you didn't have all these all these two week training deals and things like that in those days. Where did you go after basic? After you completed basic, then I, I took my basic, which would be basic infantry at Fort ben at uh, uh, Camp okay. Jaffe. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I had uh, enlisted for I had enlisted for office work and got it. I was uh, uh, took uh, what was in uh, an, the went to the adjutant general. It was an adjutant general school uh, at uh, Fort Harrison in in, in uh, Indiana. And it was uh, we, actually it was that class was uh, for an eight week second for the eight weeks of second second basic second semester in the basic was only a six week school, and it was the uh, based at least on what they were telling us at the time. It was the only school of its kind in the world. Mm -hmm. We learned how to operate how to back in the, before computers mm -hmm. when 
IBM machines were computers. You really learned how to do how to punch the punch, run a key punch machine, the typewriter that punch the key punch machines, how to run sorters, how to do collators, how to do the accounting machines. They told us, at least at that time, that if IBM wanted any of their people to know anything more than on a specific machine, IBM did not teach their people all the machines. If they had somebody that had to have that knowledge, they sent them to Fort Ben Harrison to go through that six-week school. So the Army taught them all the things about IBM. Hmm. Now, when they developed a new machine, that one individual knew how to run that machine, what made it work and everything else. They would send them to the Army if where they put one of those machines in it to teach the people how to do that. But those people, in a lot of cases, didn't know. They didn't have an idea even how to work a key punch uh, typewriter or, or, or wire a keyboard, uh, wire a board. Or do, uh, and so uh, our, our company was there and uh, class was there. And then we went from... Uh, we went for, uh, from there, uh, we got the nice uh, week and a half cruise uh, out of, uh, uh, out of uh, Brooklyn to uh, uh, to Germany. We went into, uh, and then they, of course, at that point in time when I was still, when I was at that point in time in service, you didn't know where you were going except you were going to Europe. Mm -hmm. And then they was at, they sent you to what was called a replacement depot, repo depot. And then when you got there, why they decided where you where they were going to send you, and then they sent you from over there. So uh, most of my class went went to Fr went went to France or went went over there, and then we were and we were. We were there. It was uh, we had a long weekend there up, uh, up there. Our the the place was an old uh, SS tank battalion up on a hill overlooking this nice little German town down in the valley, all white brick. I mean, all beautiful, beautiful. The buildings were beautiful, and they were just isolated enough that they weren't hurt by any of the uh, of the uh, combat that would have came through that area. Uh, and we got in there uh, just before the 4th of July. Our day that we should have been shipped out was the 4th of July. So it wasn't. So we got to party uh, on the German beer uh, the 4th of July, uh, and then they shipped us out. Most of my company, uh, most of the guys out of my, out of my group uh, that were in my class went to, uh, were shipped to various units at IB, IB, where they had IBM machines and that in Germany. I and a few of the others were uh, shipped to, uh, to France. We went to France and uh, I was with, uh, with the Engineer Supply, Engineer Supply Control Agency, which is a, uh, they, we had three supply depot, engineering, Supply depots. Mm -hmm. They they accounted to our agency for the supplies that they had in their depot. Uh, of course, I started off down in the machine room and wiring boards and something like that, and didn't know anything else about what was going on. Uh, and I figured that was what I was going to do for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'd been there less than a week, and somebody stuck his head in the door and called my name and said, the colonel wants to see you. And I turned around, and I was in the middle of wiring a, wiring a board for some job. And uh, I said, whoops. And I said, hell, I ain't been here that long. And so I went up, and here was virtually everybody from my class sitting in the hallway, just sitting there waiting for him to call me. Uh -huh. And instead of calling us all in and giving us an interview, he called us in one at a time. I was, I couldn't believe that part of it, and he did. Well, after I get, we got in, reported. He told us why. He said, "Well, he says I, we had, we're starting something new," and he says something to this effect, you know, and that uh, I had told the personnel people over there to review all the records of all the incoming people and anybody that had accounting or a lot of math and their and their records. Uh, he wanted to see their two hundred one file, so. 
that's how our all of, I mean I had guys in that group that were that let, went on I know to be college professors a couple of them in math a couple of them in history mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and the, he called us in one at a time and if he did for the and the, I was in there and I I was down close to the end of the line. It was one of the last ones they called up there, I guess. And you sat out there and twiddled your thumbs. I mean, you really were worried about what the colonel mm -hmm. was wanting to see you for. And he was calling you in one at a time. He wasn't doing any mass interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he took us over there, and he had uh, this big office. that had all these maps and boards on the wall. And he, was, he sent us over there and set us down and explained what this devil was for and what it was to be doing. And his... This, the Army had gone officially to a new accounting system, effective July the 1st, 1950, 1955. Uh, it was called stock funding. And the colonel wrote most of the book, I found out later, wrote most of the book for that stock funding program. So he was looking for, looking for people to go, that had accounting and that to go up there. They had done it as a test program, running it side by side with the whatever the program was the year before. But uh, when they put it in, well, then they were really looking for people to get in on the ground floor of that. Mm -hmm. And he told us, he's, uh, after he, I mean, you're there, and he, and he, interviewed, he gave me the, the deal just like everybody, you know. And he said, now, and he says, you don't have to, to, to move from what you want, if you want to continue to do. He says, I'm just, I'm just here I want to talk to the people and see, see if you would like to come up and do that. He says, I'm looking for people that would like to do that. He says, it won't hurt your chances of promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, it may not help them either, but he says, it isn't going to, if you don't, if you don't take me up on this, he says, that's not going to hurt your, your chances of promotion. And. So I went back and thought about it for a little bit, and I went in. Uh, you just had till that afternoon. You want to know that afternoon. I went back after lunch that afternoon and told him that I would move. And uh, a couple of the others that was there didn't, and he was right. It sure it did, it didn't hurt their chances to get promoted. I had four or five of them get get that get both next stripes up the line uh -huh. at least a month, two or three months ahead of me. So I mean, where did you move to? <laughs> Huh? Where were, where were you? Well, was, you just moved. They, they were in other offices, other sections of the agency. I moved out of the machine room downstairs and I up see. to the stock funding. But you were still in the same Oh, I was still in the same agency, okay. yeah. Okay. No, I mean, we, all of us were. In fact, I even had a couple of those guys working for me then later on because when I got in there, uh, I was probably the one with them, even though I didn't have any college uh, of any consequence other than that commercial college mm -hmm. uh, training. Uh, they had a kid that was uh, that was chief of this one section uh, that uh, was his, he was a draftee and about ready to leave. So they put me in that section then after after a time or two. Mm -hmm. But they had to get me a secret security clearance first because the report that was that that report that 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 group did when we got confident three confidential reports. Combine them. When we combine them, they become secret information. Mm -hmm. So uh, they had to clear, get me cleared on a on a security clearance. Once they got that, why well, then they put me in there with him to for me him to kind of train me on how to do the get do, which was a nice. I mean, really in the I've always bragged. I said I had a, somebody said, well, "What'd you do in the army?" I said, "Oh, I had a soft job. I had a real nice job. I worked about ten days once every three months." Yeah. Uh, uh, wasn't exactly right, but it was right. It, we had approximately 10 days. Those reports would come in. Mm -hmm. We had approximately 10 days to put it together, match it up, and ship the report out. Mm -hmm. And then because we didn't have any, basically anything else in that section to do, we would go out and grab people from all over the agency that had secret clearances, bring them in. They would work for me. It didn't make any difference what their rank was. I had that, I had sections, my, that report was, mm -hmm. I was the one that was in charge of that report. Mm -hmm. They'd come in, do do everything on that, and then when it was over with, well, they they go back to their regular jobs, and I'd sit there in the office and do what little had to be done, and 
Uh, so they finally figured out, well, I don't really didn't have that much else to do. And I had a, I had a security clearance. I got to be the chief security NCO for the agency. So I had to make sure the security safe was locked all the time. And I, and I had to go clear it out to the colonel's office to do it. Or, but there's nothing else to do. Uh, and then uh, you know, as, as time progressed, there was a little bit more. And then finally, in the, about the last year, I was over, over there after we'd done a few of those reports. He threw the book on, called me down at the office, threw the book out. He says, told me, he says, why don't you go through there and look it over? He says, it's been working now. He says, you're working more than, more than I am. He says, sit down there. He says, and you go through and see if there's anything, whatever you think needs to be changes. And he says, as you get a, as you get a, a chapter done, well, he says, give it to me and I'll, uh, you know, I'll go over. Well, I had, before I left, I had about an opportunity to do about the first three chapters of that book. And he didn't change much of anything in them, uh, but there wasn't, there wasn't that, I mean, but I mean, I did change some things and the things that needed to be changed because they, the, they weren't doing this anymore or this, uh, and so, uh, but it was, it was interesting. Uh, I, uh, like I say, they, we had three depots, they reported to us, and the only thing, bad part about the job was this kid that left, that was ahead of me, he got to, he was the last one take his last report and take it to Heidelberg because our report went when I where I was working we worked directly under Heidelberg we France had no control the people in France the military in France the army US army and military had no control over us in our offices mm -hmm. only for our billeting and our training so we didn't deal with any of those people we dealt directly under. In fact, when I first got there, I was wearing the German Heidelberg patch, which was which was a dark blue, well, the Eisenhower patch was, the shape patch was a black patch with a flaming sword and a rainbow. Well, the, your, the your suit, what they call the Usar patch, was identical, except instead of being black, it was a, a brilliant blue. And when I, we first got over there, and I first got over there, I was wearing the Heidelberg patch. And then later on, why the commanding general downtown uh, convinced uh, them over there, he still wouldn't interfere with this. That he, he wanted the people under his command for training. He wanted them wearing. He wanted them beside to him. And so we had to change our patches. But for work, our work didn't change at all. Uh, and uh, so we would. Uh, sit there, and that was long before the days. Again, of course, again, a computer. we couldn't even get our stuff on a computer. There was no way in the world we could get the machine room downstairs to run this. And the uh, those of those people that have been around for a while know that you uh, used to find, be able to find a typewriter that had about uh, a yard long carriage on it. Uh, and when they uh, of course, you're using military size paper, which was eight, not eight and a half. And there was no way to make carbon paper without taking scotch tape and taping the carbon paper together to get a sheet of carbon paper big enough because we had to make three copies of the report. So we had to. Uh, that was part of the of the job and before getting started we had to tape all these pieces of car of carbon paper together people know what carbon paper what's that uh <laughs> and we had to tape all of them together so that we would have paper carbon paper big enough to co cover all those columns on those reports and then put them in a typewriter and type those reports and of course the minute something hit that report as a, as a typed item regardless of what it was it was became secret information because we we had. What were you doing over there? We were financially accounting for all the engineering supplies in these depots, not a, not okay. on the not in the field, okay. but if they if their piece of equipment was in a depot, the depot had to give us a financial inventory of what they had. Mm -hmm. Then we combined the three depots mm -hmm. into one report. Mm -hmm. And that was a report for all of Europe. I see. Now they were doing the same type of a report coming out of Asia, or uh, and one of the same type of reports for the supplies station uh, in the United States. The report when it left my desk, 
in, at the uh, agency there, went direct to the chief of engineers, European command. He couldn't change a damn thing. Mm -hmm. All he, he, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm think he probably kept the third copy and only sent two forward. But that sheet of paper that left my desk at the end of each of those quarter re quarterly reports wound up with Chief of Engineers, the United States Army, and Washington, D.C. and the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I knew what happened to it. I mean, I knew what it was. I, I knew what all was going through it. Uh, when the reports came to us, the confidential reports from the three depots, if they had s supplies, I mean, and not to, when you're talking engineering supplies, you're not just talking a bulldozer or something like you're talking that and all the spare parts and all the other stuff was there. And all of this had to be accounted for financially. Mm -hmm. So uh, if they had uh, a, a part that, uh, or they had say six or eight parts and those six, six or eight parts financially totaled up $99. They put an asterisk on the report. A one on my report from a depot said they had $1,000 worth of those supplies. And it had, and uh, then it didn't go up until you went to 0.5, and that was two. Uh, Sorry, that's motion detectors. If we don't move, oh yeah, the that, that happened to us in our that happened to us in our committee meeting the Sorry. other night. Uh, then when I got when we got it and we combined the the, the two re, the, the three reports, if I had a one on that report, it meant I had a thousand dollars in those supplies. If I had an asterisk on there, it meant that they had anywhere from one dollar to nine hundred and ninety nine dollars worth of those supplies. Mm -hmm. So I am guessing when they took those my, my report and got it into got it into uh, and this is a guess, but I think I'm pretty accurate on it that when my my, my report got consolidated with the two other reports to be army wide, that that pro that probably showed up on their report as an asterisk, and you had to have a, probably a one on their report meant a hundred thousand dollars. That's what we were guessing it at, because we were guessing we didn't know. But if one on ours meant a thousand, theirs could have meant ten. But we figured it was so big that it would, uh, that it would probably cut it down even more. Did you say the, you were there for like three years? I did that. I did that from uh, on the quarterly basis. Of, well, I if, basically I think I I think the first one I uh, was involved with was in October of '55. And then the last one I did was in December of, 50, of 57. Because I left, I left, uh, we left there uh, back to Bremerhaven. Uh, and while we got on a ship, we were to come home, had a nice little cruise back and with a, with a, with a layover in Southampton, we actually got a chance, and top three graders could get off the ship. So we went in, got off, we got off the ship, and went up, went went in and uh, to a restaurant in, in there in town, and to some of the pubs there in town. On the thirtieth day of, of, of December, nineteen fifty-seven, and I said, I said, Happy New Year. Uh -huh. uh, after a Day long cruise away from away from England, but uh, so I that that year turned over while I was while I was uh, on my second ocean cruise. Mm -hmm. Then I got back. Of course, I came home, and uh, with the uh, with went into the reserve. Our unit at Champagne was a uh, started off as a uh, was very interesting. I really enjoyed that part of it. Uh, it was a uh, subsistence supply company, which meant we did uh, ration breakdown. You, when you go, uh, all the mess halls would come to, we would push, would uh, issue out all the supplies of mm -hmm. food on a, on a daily or uh, basis uh, or that, including uh, we even had cold stores. Right? We even handled the meat and everything else. 
Uh, and I did that for about the first, well, I really wasn't too much involved in that. They had me right away doing the administrative portion and the reports and all that. I did, did almost all my military service being uh, on, on the administrative side of it. Uh, but uh, I did work I, I, as a to kind of fill me in a spot um, for a long while. My, my formal spot said that I was in charge of the coal stores. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I walked in and out of quite a few uh, walk through storage areas at, at uh, uh, Fort McCoy uh, at, or Camp McCoy before it was Fort McCoy. I was all these before they were turned into forts. Uh, mm -hmm. And that uh, we we had one summer camp at uh, with them uh, at uh, Leonard Wood, uh, and of course they did ration breakdown a lot a little different, but we did ration breakdown for them down there part of it. Uh, then later on they uh, changed our unit from subsistence supply to what they called direct support, which meant we had every quartermaster item there was. We did. Russian breakdown. We had uh, coal stores. We had uh, laundries. We had uh, uh, petroleum supply. Uh, we had the tailor shops. Anything that was quartermaster deal, we had under. Uh, suppose we had that shoe repair shops. That was the first item of, of equipment that we got. Was how to was how to actually more repair boots so they always had and the only thing that guys knew how to do and that this was in the reserve there in urbana the only thing they knew how to do was how to put heels on your boots and uh so they they'd come along and they pull an inspection we'd pull an inspection almost every every drill you know somebody had a a worn heel on their boot well they we'd make them take their boots off take them out so that the guys that could had in the in the uh shoe repair shop had something to do <laughs> And finally, it got down so bad that we're looking for something to do that even their low quarters or civilian type shoes, we'd put boot heels on the back of those. <laughs> so they had some. But we did have, of course, in those days, they didn't really put a, a limit on the number of people that you could have in a reserve unit mm -hmm. during Vietnam. So we had tons of college students coming out volunteering to go into, re go in, go into reserves so they wouldn't get drafted. And... Uh, after while we, we were still that, and while I was still with part of that, part of that, I also had charge that went during for a while that uh, had the uh, uh, the tailor shop on that, and I I had a bunch of college students that were wound up if they if if they couldn't make it in whatever they were going, whatever the, uh, they were learning to be. Or their wives ever found out how good they could w work with a, with a sewing machine? <laughs> I got new, bad news for those boys because that was also another way they could make some extra money. Uh, I had a couple of those couple of those college students. Uh, I don't know what they were studying uh, as a, as a student, but they were fabulous. They they did they could do fabulous work too. They right there in the field, and it was out on the grass under a tent. They tailored one general's uniform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, and then we had a bakery. Our the poor people that really did our bakery was out of our group that was attached to us from uh, Danville, but uh, they'd break sweet rolls and everything once every day. We'd have all that extra that wasn't even out of the, it was just for something to do. Mm -hmm. And they'd have people. He'd have people there from the headquarters at McCoy coming down to in the afternoon. That's what they. Somebody would get a whiff of that coming through the air down there, and they'd call up and say, hey, it sounds like it's bakery, bakery time. And all of a sudden, here come all these people coming down to get. And if somebody needed, you know, also with that, and then we also had sewing machines. So eventually, there in Urbana, if you needed that, and get, if you got a promotion, they'd sew the stripes on for them just for something to do. Were you um, shipped out anywhere else? Besides France? Well, I, the last, I, I, they finally turned that unit into a chemical unit, smoke generator. And so I had to come into a new, a new phase of what was going on, mm -hmm. which chemical, radio, CBR, chemical radiological and, and uh, uh, warfare. 
And uh, that was, we did, uh, even in this, we'd go out and we had, well, one of our kids, one of my clerks, uh, one of a good, one of my good clerks was a, owned a hell of a lot of farmland up on Northwest Champaign. And we'd take our smoke generators out there and blow them across his fields for training. Uh, the, uh, and of course, then we'd, we'd do smoke generator work at summer camps or scre uh, smoke screen stuff and things like that. Uh, and then I got a little more into the, uh, to the uh, radiological field on it and uh, fallout and that for uh, nuclear. And you did that work in Champaign though? Uh, I, well, we, all, all of those kind of units have that type uh -huh. of stuff. And I, I wound up being them basically the, uh, that. And then when I transferred out of that unit, I didn't ever, I had got as far a rank as I was ever going to get. And I didn't even think I'd ever get master. And what rank did you? I was a, I was an SFC. That was as high as I was going to get it at uh, at the Urbana unit. But then when I went over to uh, Indianapolis, it was a they call it a depot, but uh, I it, it was a strange setup to me. I never could I never did really figure it totally out. We were Army Reserve under the Army Reserve Command in down what was in downtown Indianapolis, but we had various National Guard units around the state of Indiana that were serviced through our, our depot and, other, uh, and, uh, and uh, we had certain control functions over them. I didn't really have any control function over them, but I, wor I worked in the, I was the, I was the uh, chemical uh, CBR, chemical, radio, uh, chemical biological and radiological NCO for the depot which was basically for that of two thirds of Indiana, as far as the military was concerned. And uh, so I went out and took some extra training on that out at uh, uh, El Paso out at, uh, and then when I came, then we, some of that, after that, with that unit, basically we would go to the, to the uh, places like we went out to to Willow, which is a uh, depot out on just out outside, of, a little ways outside, where one of the places where they were destroying chemical munitions, and we had reservists that were go in there and work in those in the in those places uh, and uh, that to uh, destroy uh, chemical burn chemical munitions. You get these gas masks, you know. When you went out there, you put your hung your gas mask on a, on a, on a peg and pick up one over here that really works. <laughs> and then when you out of, out there, you took that one with you, and it's, it's true. They want to there were rabbits and all the birds they could find flying around out there, because if they, they found a dead one, all of a sudden it was time to put on a gas mask. And I mean, it was right out in the open, mm -hmm. but you were way out in the way, but you out. But till they could find out what the problem was, uh, safety was the best, mm -hmm. best, uh, best deal. And then I got an opportunity to go over and uh, get a, I don't remember that much about it now, except that where they had the uh, famous, uh, all the uh, cattle were, uh, died, but were supposedly over gas. Uh, a leak gas or poison gas deal uh, out there in Utah, back down in the south, uh, uh, in the cent west central Utah, and was a military post over there. And one day I was on a, on a group that was that went over to take it to, to go over there for basically just a tour, just for the sake of something to do. I think it was, but it's I've had you know over the period of time I went from beating on a keyboard to uh, wearing a gas mask and, and, a little and, dangerous. Uh, and yeah. uh, going in, going in and uh, and uh, with the, having the guy being in charge of guys that were actually destroying chemical munitions and these super hot furnaces and things like that I mean it, it had a nice range of 
mm -hmm. military over it, all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, finally you, retired after. You retired, yeah. And the Army's paying me again now. <laughs> Did you, uh, after you retired, where you, you told me you lived in Champaign, the whole, yeah. okay. Um, get married? No. No? No. No, I was still, uh, all this, all the time I was in the, in the Yankee Reserve, I was still working at U of I. My mother was still living at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, I had actually retired. Uh, I I was a retired reservist before I retired, but but I wasn't old enough to draw pay out of it because it was a reserve period. So uh, most of my uh, uh, but I, I stayed. People could ask them why. I said I were retired from U of I with 38 years. Said, what are you doing that? You could have quit a long time ago. And of course, for a good portion of those last few years, except the last about five. Uh, my mother was living in that. We were still living together, mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, I, I got to be around here anyhow. I better just well have something to do. I, I don't know. I can put up with her <laughs> all day. Let her, her put up with me. So uh, I, uh, I just, so uh, I stayed. I stayed. And then after, of course, I, I had then sort of quit, but semi retired mm -hmm. as far as the military is concerned. Uh, and still, while I was still working there at the, at the U of I. Because yeah, I didn't leave the U of I until until April of two thousand. April of two thousand. Did you receive any um, medals or citations or anything? For the Surprisingly military? enough, I got a good conduct medal along with three years of <laughs> service. <laughs> and you're just joking. Uh -huh. <laughs> you're just joking. You're not surprised that you got good conduct, are you? Did you get well, in trouble? Over, over one incident, I guess. And I, no, it shouldn't have affected. Can you but it share that have, incident but it with could me? Have, you know, we, uh, so we were uh, 85. I was at uh, uh, Orleans, which is approximately 85 miles south of Paris is where we were. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we were on out in the country after that. And there was four of us. This was close to the time that we were coming back. And uh, I had just... I, I had a, but I was over there a year, and one of the guys in the unit was leaving, and of course he wasn't going to bring that. Oh, I don't remember now what it was, but uh, anyhow, I bought his car off of him. So the, after the, uh, then before I came home, I, I had got up. To, I was an E5, so that I had uh, I could get Garmy to ship a car back for me. I, you know, so I bought out, went out over there, over there, bought a new car, and. Uh, bunch of stuff I could ship whole baggage I could have shipped for well I did I shipped for shipped them one piece of furniture from over there over back back home and I could put I ship some I could ship more than one I you know a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of stuff so I did and uh, I uh, so we took that car and took it on a, about a 30-day leave uh, four of us and we went Went up, uh, back up through uh, that across into England. We got England, uh, Ireland, uh, Scotland, Ireland. Came back into London again. Then went across and basically uh, well through Brussels and down, and then went down the uh, the Rhine, and then all, all the way over to uh, to Ber uh, Berlin, uh, to, Bu um, to Munich, and then back. And we were in we were in Paris, uh, and uh, we weren't planning on going back till Monday because we thought that was when we were up, and something had happened while we were gone, and uh, we were supposed to have been back the previous Friday. <laughs> so uh, things were a little touchy there at the break. They didn't have a way of getting hold of you, did uh, they? No one we saw to that, I will admit. But then uh, there, there, we wouldn't have known where we were going to be anyhow. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and I still travel that way. And all the travels that I do as far as the Legion and the Sons of the Legion is concerned. I, people say, well, you know, and you get all this stuff for being in all the hotels. Said, well, you got all this. I says, well, you, number one, you got to get advanced reservations for, to use all that stuff. And I says, when I'm on the road. I just drive till I'm ready to quit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how am I going to do it? So uh, I don't know how it's out there. I don't even try to look it up. It's there if I, I've only used 
pull that off once, I think. But uh, no, it's just the idea that uh, we, we, I'm, my mother, both of my mother's parents were born in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So I had a, an opportunity uh, to go. Uh, I was, the first leave I took, I took by train. And then I came back through, I came back through uh, Switzerland, met this one uh, family that uh, he had been in the States, but was back over there and lived there. He was there all during the war. The first thing we did after I got out to where they lived, because uh, it, it's Schaffhausen, Switzerland, there's a little point of tip of Switzerland that sticks up into Germany. And they live this little town where my grandfather was born, and the one where my grandmother was born. You can stand in one and see the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first thing we did after we got out to his house, after they got me from the train downtown, he said, "Let's take a walk." And we walked up the hill and back and down through the fields and back out there. And you went there was a little cliffside there. Down below it, there was this ro a road on this side of the, of the creek and the creek on the other side. And then he said, you see down there? He says, this the creek down there? He says, this side is Switzerland, the other side is Germany. Hmm. And uh, so he was, was telling me, he said, during the war, that was all lined along the other side of the creek with Bob wire. Hmm. And uh, he said that there were a few people that tried to cross, across there, and he says, Couple made it, <laughs> but uh, he uh, he had uh, come over uh, come over to come, uh, here at the states, and then as a kid went back, and he'd been he had traveled back and forth, uh, but uh, and then I, I stopped I stopped off with their with the, there a couple three other times while I was over there running around with the car. And uh, I could get down there, but uh, it's a beautiful country. And I, when I when I went over here, I'm going to Europe. Boy, I'm not going to see it. I'm going to see some nice mountains and hills and all this and that. And I went to Orleans, France. When in France, the U.S. Army couldn't build permanent buildings. And when I first got there, we were in Quonset huts. Mm -hmm. uh, they could build even our. Agency building was a semi-permanent building, but you could see the cracks in the floors where the where the sections were connected. Mm -hmm. they, they, and so, but they could build a, a pretty solid building if it was to be called a hospital. So they built a reserve hospital and then turned it into quarters for us. Mm -hmm. And when I got in there, I got a second floor second floor room all the way to the what would be basically, I would call it the north side of the ring, looked out the window and I could see the spirals of the cathedral in Orleans about four miles away. <laughs> well, and that was, of course, we'd been over there for, I think I was only in that place about eight, nine months. That was four, by the time they built that out there for it. Like I says, Here I was coming to Europe to see, see and I did. I saw, saw some beautiful country and driving up. Made it probably went over to one of the religious retreats and took another kid from where we were, drove over and down into Switzerland and drive down across the North Edge and over into Liechtenstein and crossed them. We crossed, thank God we did it at night. We crossed over some ravine on a road that was under that was under construction and the bridge over that ravine was like those old country country red bridges out here. And around this part of the country, where you're driving on on a on a on boards. I mean, it was laid <laughs> out, but you had board you had yeah. boards as tracks. I said, I'm glad I couldn't see down that. It was dark. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's a good thing I didn't, couldn't see it. And we got across that. It wasn't big, but it was. I I, I knew it was deep. But uh, sounds like your overall experience. Oh, was I mean, one. it was yeah. uh, it was it was I. I uh, I'd love to get back over there, but I just, I don't know. Talk Have you um, taken the honor flight? No, I've been just like pestered into this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, I don't know. I've, uh, I've thought about it. Uh, I've, I've got, I've got some, I've got some relatives uh, 
that that have done it. Uh, basically, those most of my most of the family that I've got left is I'm on my mother's side. The family they're all down around Vandalia, uh, or either there or all over the country. Mm -hmm. I only know have one basically one relative I know on my dad's side. The family, and they they're over uh, upriver from Cincinnati a little ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had some of my cousins down there in Vandalia that's taken it. I know a lot of people in, Champ in the Champaign-Urbana area, not only, but all, all around Illinois, through my, my re relationships with the people from the Legion that have taken it. And, uh, I've had a couple bunch of people on me, but I said, well, I get, I get out there once. Or, I've got out there. I haven't been there for a couple of years now. But uh, I get out there, but I, I've thought about it too, maybe one of these days. Just like this, I've thought about it too. But. Well, you should probably do it. <laughs> well, maybe I'll, I, but I, I get all, all these things, and uh, when I go, when I, usually most of the places I go, I drive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, so, you know, like going out there, I went, was out there some years ago, basically, the one year that the Legion National Convention was in Honolulu. I did that last time, and I, I couldn't go. I had some things that came up, said I couldn't go. Then that changed. It all came going. Then it changed back. It switched back. Finally, got too late to make any plans at all, so I stayed home. And then on that Sunday morning for the Sons of American Legion Convention, I'm... Uh, that I'm also very active in. Uh, I got a phone call saying that they had, of course, uh, they had just announced that the guy that was the national commander that year had just got word that his father died. Mm -hmm. And I had met his father over the years. This kid was, the guy was from living in, uh, and working in Iowa at the time, but his dad and, that, and most of the rest of his family is still in Maryland. And I had known. I had known met his, met, his, met his dad especially two or three, a few times in the past, and I figured, well, I'm past, I'm past national commander. He's the national commander. I'll go represent the organization. So I, st I told him, the people from Illinois that called me. I said, I'm, I'll go. And then pretty soon, one of the national officers' sons told me, called me and says, Oh, you don't have to go. He says, we got two past national commanders out there on the East Coast. He says, one of them can go and represent us. So I kind of said, well, I'm going anyhow, because he's a friend of mine. And uh, so I went ahead and I went out there. I, had, I usually go as far as uh, this one town in West Virginia and spend the night and then go on. I had got there. I was already got up the next morning. It was just about as high, going, get ready to break the crest, start going down, which was naturally after I was already in Maryland. And my phone rang, and it was uh, the uh, national adjutant for the Sons of the American Legion. He said, are you still planning on going to Maryland? I said, well, I think so. I'm in Maryland. <laughs> and so uh, they said, well, the, the other, other guys weren't going to be able to make it, so they are going to. Had me go and represent the organization, you guys. Good thing you know. you decided to go. Huh? But I mean, I, I would, I would, well, all these years, when, uh, for years, we'd play the game, and uh, especially before I was eligible for the Legion, because my the Legion's time when I went in, uh, the, the cutoff date now is that January 31st day. Mm -hmm. But when I went in, it was back in July of 53. Now I got a cousin that's four days younger than I am. He went in right out of high school. He's been eligible to belong to American Legion all those years, mm -hmm. but uh, until they changed the dates, uh, I wasn't eligible for the Legion. Now once they changed the dates, they, they went down to the end of the Korean GI Bill, which was January 31st. I went in on the 27th. Mm -hmm. I got my one day. Yep. Uh, in fact, I got three of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course, immediately they. There wasn't any question, of course, it was back. It was, I had been with the Legion and that through the Sons of the Legion. Uh, why, uh, very active. Uh, there wasn't any question about mm -hmm. uh, what I, that, that I was going to go into that. And then, of course, I did. Uh, 
been as as an officer officer at some level ever since the first well, the third month I was a member. So, <laughs> so. I think we're gonna probably need to wrap it up here, Ethan. Did you have anything you wanted to ask him? Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, yeah. Because of time, um, getting late. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I don't think no. so. No. Well, thank you for your service. And thank you for, what you say, being badgered into this. <laughs> thank you for sitting down with us today. <laughs> um, well, she'd been after me for a long time. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank uh, you for participating, okay? Yeah. Now I have to put